I don't much need a microphone either, but uh, uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Hallman. Uh, he got his Ph.D. from uh, Auburn. He did it on Alabama's first constitution, which I think Gerald Johnson, if you've ever had any of his classes, will tell you. It's probably still our only constitution. Um, Dr. Hallman's with the Air Force Historical Branch at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, is a, uh, author of a number of books about aviation. Uh, he's probably like me. Uh, I, every time an airplane flies over, I have to look at it. And uh, I really enjoy the history of uh, the U.S. Air Force, uh, despite the fact that I spent my earliest career as a Marine walking here and there and uh, hoping nobody bombed me. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Hallman, and uh, he, he will uh, give you a lecture and show you some slides, and, and we're going to learn a lot about a very interesting character, uh, Admiral Yamamoto. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to come speak with you today. I appreciate you showing up. And I also want to thank the people involved in the audiovisual setup. I have a lapel mic. Can everybody hear me all right? I thought I would divide our time and into four segments. The first segment, I'd like to, to mostly read a paper that I have about the Yamamoto mission. And the reason I want to do that is because I don't want to leave out any important details. Sometimes if I just show slides and talk about the slides, I might leave out something important. So I'd like to do that first, and then after I finish that, then I'll show you some slides to reiterate some of the things I've been talking about. And then after that, we'll have a question and answer session. And then following that, the last segment will be signing books. I have copies of this booklet called Killing Yamamoto that has some of the details, some of the photographs, too, that you'll see in the slides about the Yamamoto mission. It's a very interesting mission from World War II. So first I'm going to concentrate on the paper and then I'll get to the slides. Of all the enemies of the United States during World War II, one of the most hated was Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the combined Japanese Imperial Fleet. He had planned the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor that had killed more than 225 2,400 Americans on December 7, 1941. He had also planned the attack on Midway in mid-1942, which, although a decisive American victory, resulted in many American casualties. One of the primary reasons why the United States won the Battle of Midway was because American intelligence had broken the Japanese code. If American planners had not discovered the Japanese plans in advance, Yamamoto might not have succeeded in the eventual might have succeeded in the eventual conquest of the Hawaiian Islands. As you know, as many of you know, Midway is just west of the main islands of the Hawaiian chain. The same kind of American intelligence revealed in April of 1943 that Yamamoto was scheduled to make an inspection flight from Rabaul, which was one of the most important bases of the Japanese in the Southwest Pacific to Balali near Bougainville and the northern Solomon Islands. He had never before come so close to American lines. The message contained details about exactly where he would be and when he would be there. U.S. Marine Corps Major Alva Brian Red Laswell, his nickname was Red Laswell, an intelligence analyst at Pearl Harbor's Fleet Radio Unit Pacific, among others, received and decoded the key message. The information revealed that Admiral Yamamoto would be flying aboard a Mitsubishi G4M medium twin-engine bomber, the Allies called the Betty, and it would be escorted by six Zero fighters. The Betty bomber had a reputation for long range because of its large fuel capacity. But it all was also, for that same reason, very vulnerable to enemy aircraft fire. Yamamoto had a reputation, too, for punctuality. If he planned to be at a certain place at a certain time, 
you could be sure he would be there at that time. When Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, learned of this intelligence, he notified authorities in Washington who endorsed a bold mission to assassinate the Japanese admiral. Nimitz contacted Admiral William F. Halsey, commander in the South Pacific, who assigned the project to Rear Admiral Mark A. Mitcher, M-I-T-S-H-S-C-H-E-R, commander of Joint Air Operations in the Solomons. The assignment was appropriate. Mitcher had been commander of the USS Hornet, the aircraft carrier from which Jimmy Doolittle had launched the first raid on Japan on April 18, 1942, exactly a year before the anticipated Yamamoto flight. Planners of the mission to assassinate Yamamoto gathered on Guadalcanal, an American-held island closest to Bougainville. Several officers took part in the initial planning. Besides Mitcher, they included his chief of staff, General Field Harris, Commander Stanhope C. Ring, Colonel Edwin L. Pugh, and Major John P. Condon of Fighter Command Solomons. They were all Naval or Marine Corps personnel. So this operation wasn't just an Army Air Forces operation. It involved Marine Corps and Navy uh, personnel as well. Lieutenant Colonel Aaron W. Tyre, T-Y-E-R, commander of one of the Army Air Forces airfields on Guadalcanal and commander of the 18th Fighter Group, also contributed ideas related to the resources available. The planners decided the raiders would have to counter Japanese radar by flying low, avoiding a direct route over the Japanese-held islands between Guadalcanal and Bougainville, and keeping radio silence. You can imagine trying to keep the Allied planes together for such a long distance with an indirect route where they have to turn on certain places with radio silence. The circuitous route between Guadalcanal and Bougainville and back would require fighters that could fly more than 400 miles to the target and then return. The only fighter planes on Guadalcanal with such a range were Army Air Force P-38s with special drop tanks. Consequently, the mission was assigned to Army Air Force's organizations already based on the island. They included the 12th and 70th Fighter Squadrons of the 18th Fighter Group and the 339th Fighter Squadron of the 347th Fighter Group. Pilots of those squadrons were selected to take part in the mission, some to attack the Yamamoto plane and others to escort them. They served as a special detachment under the 13th Air Force. Major John W. Mitchell commanded the 339th Fighter Squadron and he assumed command of the mission. If anybody gets credit for the success of the Yamamoto mission, of course it was a lot of different personnel involved, but I think he would get the most credit because he's the one who actually led the mission, even though he didn't actually fire the bullets that got uh, Yamamoto. In consultation with Lieutenant Colonel Henry Vicellio from 13th Air Force Headquarters, Mitchell decided to hit Yamamoto while he was still in the air over Bougainville rather than after he landed because there was more likelihood, likelihood he would not survive such an attack. Some of the naval personnel wanted him to land first and then get off the plane and get on a boat and be on the boat on the water and get him on the boat. But uh, he wanted to get him in the air to make sure they got him. On the evening of April 17th, Major Mitchell converted the flight navigation plan he received from Major Condon into detailed instructions for his pilots. He planned for 18 P-38s to be involved, 14 to ward off enemy fighters, which he would lead himself, Mitchell would lead those escort fighters, and four for the attacking flight. Now, if it were up to me, looking back at this mission, I think I would have assigned more than four aircraft to the attacking flight and fewer than 14 for the escorts. But I wasn't in charge of the mission. They, they knew more about the details than I did. Two of the 18 P-38s had to abort the mission when it launched on Sunday morning, April 18th, the anniversary of the Doolittle Raid. I believe it was also Palm Sunday that day. One blew a tire on takeoff, and the other aircraft failed to draw fuel from its drop tanks. So, so two in the four attacking flight 
had to drop out because of problems with their aircraft. The 16 remaining P-38s continued on the mission to reassign from attack to escort duty. The long flight from Guadalcanal to Bougainville covered more than 400 miles and took about two hours. The formation went west for 183 miles, then turned northwest for another 88 miles, then turned even more northward for another 125 miles. 16 miles from Bougainville, the P-38s turned northeast on a plan, on a path expected to take them into the right side of the group of planes in which Yamamoto was riding, since that flight was expected to be flying southeastward. And I might mention here, I don't have it in my paper and I didn't have it on the slides either, that those aircraft, those P-38 aircraft were designed to fly at very high altitudes they weren't flying at high altitudes on this mission because they wanted to dis disguise their presence when, as they flew over some of these islands or near some of these islands. So they were flying very low, and it was April, it was over the South Pacific, and it was very, very hot. You can imagine flying these planes for hundreds of miles in intense heat and uh, some of the things they went through while on the way to the, to the area of the rendezvous. The Japanese formation in which Yamamoto was flying included eight airplanes, not one, but two G4M, I'm sorry, GM4 Betty bombers being used as transports for airfields, being used as transports. Yamamoto and his staff and the six Zero escort fighters to protect them. So they were expecting from the message that they had decoded one Japanese bomber with Yamamoto aboard, being escorted by six escort fighters, six zeros. And what the Japanese actually launched was two Betty bombers, with not only Yamamoto and many of his staff and one bomber, but the rest of his staff on another bomber. And they didn't know which plane he was on. The Japanese airplanes left for a ball about 8 o'clock American time flying southeastward, and arrived over southern Bougainville Island about 9.34 for about one hour and 34 minutes flying time. The Japanese formation flew at an altitude of 6,500 feet most of the way, but descended over southern Bougainville to a little over 2,000 feet, preparing to land either at an airfield on the southern end of the island or at Bilali, a small island just south of Bougainville. The American formation, led by Colonel John Mitchell, included 16 P-38 fighters, as I mentioned, four in the attack flight and 12 as escorts. The four in the attack flight were led by Captain Thomas G. Lanfear, Jr. The other pilots included Lieutenant Rex T. Barber, Lanfear's wingman, and Lieutenant Begs Besby F. Holmes and his wingman, Raymond K. Hine. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept of a wingman, usually a pilot didn't fly by himself, he had a wingman with him. And there were two sets of uh, attack aircraft in the four-plane flight to, to attack Yamamoto's aircraft. All 16 pilots left Guadalcanal about 7.25 American time and arrived at Bougainville about 9.34 for a flying time of about two hours and nine minutes to the target. Although they flew generally Northwest, the route was circuitous. Total flying time to target and back, as I mentioned, was more than four hours. The American P-38s flew at an altitude of less than 1,000 feet most of the way over water to avoid detection. They had to make sure they didn't get too close to the water. They climbed in the vicinity of Bougainville. The attack flight to the level of the expected Japanese bombers and the escorts to a much higher altitude to counter any Japanese fighter opposition that they expected from nearby bases in the vicinity, because there were other Japanese airfields on Bougainville and on those islands in the Solomons. Most P-38s could fly at a maximum speed of more than 400 miles per hour, but the P-38s on this mission flew more like 200 miles per hour, because they carried an extra extraordinary, extraordinarily heavy load of fuel in special larger auxiliary fuel tanks designed for the mission, two per plane, which they dropped upon reaching the target area. Also slowing the P-38s was the low altitude of most of the flight, where the air was denser. 
As the P-38s approached Bougainville, they encountered the airplanes in the Yamamoto flight at the expected place and time. That's what was so miraculous about this mission. The planning was so well done that where, when they arrived at the place at the time, Yamamoto and his planes were right there at the same time. The meticulous planning along with Yamamoto's reputation for punctuality benefited the Raiders. Major Mitchell led 12 of the P-38s on a climb to at least 15,000 feet to meet the swarm of Japanese Zero fighters he expected to emerge from Kahili, a Japanese airfield on Bougainville, and to confront the six Zeros escorting Yamamoto, the Yamamoto bomber. The other four P-38s, flown by Lanfear and Barber, Hein and Holmes, went after Yamamoto. The surprise for the American P-38 pilots was that there were two Japanese Betty bombers, the type American intelligence had indicated would be carrying Yamamoto. The Americans did not know which held their prey. They dropped their auxiliary fuel tanks, now almost empty, in order to gain increased speed and maneuverability. Something went wrong. When Holmes tried to drop his fuel tanks, they would not fall. He turned violently away, hoping the acceleration would allow him to get rid of the tanks for combat. And when he did, his wingman, Hein, followed him. So that took two of the four planes for the attacking flight off in another direction. Lanfear and Barber were the only two that were still chasing the bombers. They were facing two Japanese bombers and their six escorting fighters. For a short time over Bougainville, it was two against eight. The odds didn't look good. The other P-38s were high above, looking for enemy fighters to emerge from Bougainville's airfields. Lanfear turned into the Zero escorts, while Barber went after one of the bombers, which was diving rapidly to avoid him. Barber chased one of them and fired, hitting the Betty from behind. Barber then temporarily lost sight of his prey, but when he turned to look back, he could see a bomber crash into the jungle and assumed he had hit the airplane. That's not exactly accurate. He turned, he saw smoke coming from the jungle, but he wasn't sure, he had, didn't see the, act, the actual crash. He did not know whether Yamamoto was aboard that bomber or the other one. In the meantime, Lanfear, after having taken shots at the Zeros escorting the bombers, flipped over to try to reach one of the bombers. He claimed to have spotted one descending over the island and fired at it briefly from its right side. Like Barber, Lanfear also saw a Japanese bomber crash into the jungle with black smoke rising above the palm trees. Like Barber, he thought he had shot down one of the bombers over Bougainville, but did not yet know whether it was the one in which Admiral Yamamoto was riding. Meanwhile, Holmes had managed to finally get rid of that auxiliary fuel tank that uh, he couldn't get rid of at first, and he and his wingman, Hine, went after the second bomber. It veered out over the sea south of Bougainville, and they shot at it. Having disposed of one bomber over the island, Barber joined Holmes and Hine in attacking the second bomber, and it crashed into the sea. The attack flight had succeeded in its mission. Both bombers had been shot down. Yet at the time, no one knew which of the bombers con contained Yamamoto and whether he survived the crash, either on the island or into the sea. So they didn't know whether Yamamoto was actually killed or not. The four pilots in the attack flight immediately headed back toward Guadalcanal, but only three of them returned safely. And incidentally, when they returned to Guadalcanal, they didn't take that circuitous route anymore. They went directly to Guadalcanal because they didn't have that much fuel left. Hine disappeared on the mission, probably shot down by one of the escort fighters, or by Zeros from Kahili. The 12 escorting P-38s, their mission accomplished, also returned to Guadalcanal this time flying them on a more direct path. When Lanfear, Barber, and Holmes returned to Guadalcanal, they gave intelligence officers an account of what they had observed. Lanfear claimed to have shot down Yamamoto because he assumed Yamamoto was on the lead bomber that he had shot at over Bougainville. Barber also claimed to have shot down Yamamoto because he assumed that Yamamoto was on the bomber he had shot down over Bougainville. 
The intelligence officers took their word for having each shot down a bomber over the island and at first gave them each credit for having shot down a Japanese bomber over the island. But still, if Yamamoto was on one of the two bombers that went down over the island, no one knew which one had contained Yamamoto. The other bomber that Holmes and Barber had shot down over the sea was considered at first by intelligence officers to have been a third Betty bomber, which had entered the vicinity from elsewhere. So the intelligence officers that gathered the uh, reports at the end and tried to come to conclusions about what had actually happened. They knew Barber claimed to have shot down a bomber over the island, Lanfear claimed to have shot down a bomber over the island, and then another bomber went down over the sea. So they interpreted that as three bombers having gone down, when actually there were only two bombers in the Japanese flight, and there was only one that crashed on the island, and it turned out to be the one that contained Yamamoto. The confused officers gave Lanfear and Barber each credit for one bomber over the island, and Holmes and Barber each half a credit for a third bomber over the sea. Hine, the P-38 pilot who had failed to return, got no credit. What had actually happened? There were only two Betty bombers in the Yamamoto flight. The one that was shot down over the island of Bougainville did indeed contain Admiral Yamamoto. Part of the Admiral's staff was on the other bomber that went down at sea, and some of those passengers survived. Although the American pilots thought they had shot down Yamamoto, they could not announce that publicly. Can you imagine if they had come back and immediately told everybody they had shot down Yamamoto? The Japanese would know their codes had been broken. How would, they, how would the Americans know that Yamamoto would be in that place at that time unless they had broken the Japanese codes. Despite Lanfear's eagerness to claim he had shot down Yamamoto, he and the other pilots were told to keep their mouths shut about the operation. It was still classified. That didn't keep Lanfear from bragging that he had shot down Yamamoto when he landed at Guadalcanal. The Japanese, too, were not eager to announce that Admiral Yamamoto had been shot down over Bougainville on April 18, 1943, because that would have lowered morale. They wanted to make sure he was not among one of the survivors of the flight. They found his body easily identifiable because the Admiral had lost two fingers in a naval engagement during the Russo-Japanese War. His body was recovered on Bougainville and returned by ship to Japan. When the Japanese finally admitted that their famous Admiral had been lost in combat, the Americans could announce that they had shot him down, although they pretended it was a lucky shot during aerial combat over the Solomon Islands. In fact, after they got Yamamoto, they launched some other flights to the same area to make the Japanese think these were just routine flights, and that was just a lucky shot. Eventually, the Americans realized there were only two Betty bombers on the Yamamoto flight, and that a third bomber had not entered the scene only one bomber had crashed on the island of Bougainville. If Barber and Lanfear had both shot a bomber on, on that, over the island that day, they must have both been shooting at the same plane. Credit for shooting down Yamamoto's plane and killing Yamamoto was split between them years later when the Air Force decided to split uh, aerial victory credits. Barber seems to have been happy to share half a credit for killing Yamamoto at first. But, Yama, but Lanfear continued to claim that he alone had achieved the goal. Incidentally, by then, Lanfear had come back, was a hero, and he was the first uh, president of the Air Force Association. I don't know if there might be members of the Air Force Association here, but Lanfear was pretty famous uh, after World War II, partly because of the claim he had shot down Yamamoto. A great controversy brewed for years afterwards over which of the two pilots should have more credit for shooting down Yamamoto, Lanfear or Barber. Eventually, friends of Barber claimed that Lanfear's account was less credible than Barber's, especially after discovery of the wreckage and the Japanese autopsy revealed after the war showed that the Yamamoto airplane went down more as a result of fire from the back than from the side. Remember, Lanfear was claiming to have shot the bomber down from the side, from the right side. Barber claimed to have shot down the bomber from, by chasing it from the rear. 
1978, the United States Air Force published USAF Historical Study Number 85, which listed the official aerial victory credits of Air American uh, Army Air Force pilots in World War II. The study awarded half a credit each to Barber and Lanfear for the Yamamoto bomber. Because of challenges to that determination, the Air Force called an Air Force Victory Credit Board of Review, which met in March of 1985 at the Albert F. Simpson Historical Research Center, now called the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base. And I was on that committee. I had just started working as a historian at Air Force Historical Research Agency. I started actually working at the agency in 1982, but I had just moved into the historian slot just a couple of months before that. And one of my first assignments was to serve on that committee to re-examine that, uh, ya that Yamamoto mission and try to determine whether the credits were split accurately. The board determined that the credit was properly split between Lanfear and Barber. Challenges continued, and in 1991, the case was reopened with the Air Force Board for the Correction of Military Records in Washington, D.C. That board used the same evidence, but did not come unanimously, as the first board had, to the same conclusion. It was deadlocked between those who wanted to keep the credit split between Lanfear and Barber and those who wanted to give sole credit to Rex T. Barber. The Secretary of the Air Force at the time was Donald P. Rice, B. Rice. He broke the deadlock and decided to keep the credit split. Barber supporters challenged Rice's authority to make that decision. And in March 1996, the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals determined that Rice had acted properly. So it was a very controversial case. It went all the way to a federal court. The credit for shooting down Yamamoto remains officially split between Barber and Lanfear, but there's still a lot of controversy over it. There's still people who claim that Barber did it by himself, and others claim that it should be split between Lanfear and Barber. Regardless of who got the aerial victory credit, the mission to kill Yamamoto was a tremendous success. Besides the shooters, the real heroes were mission leader Major John W. Mitchell of the Army Air Forces, Mission Planner U.S. Marine Corps Major John P. Condon, and code breakers such as Major Alva B. Laswell, also of the Marine Corps. The death of Yamamoto was not just revenge for Pearl Harbor. It deprived the Japanese of one of their greatest strategists and admirals. If Yamamoto had not been killed on April 18, 1943, on the anniversary of the Doolittle Raid, he might have survived to plan more attacks similar to the ones at Pearl Harbor and Midway. Despite the breaking of the Japanese code, those plans might have had some success, resulting in the deaths of many more Americans. Some people criticized Yamamoto for his faulty planning in the Midway attack, but can you imagine if the Americans hadn't broken the Japanese codes and knew where the Japanese would be, Yamamoto might have succeeded in that plan. As it was, the loss of Yamamoto deprived the Japanese not only of one of their greatest military leaders, but also of a good deal of their morale. At the same time, it eventually bolstered American morale to know that the villain of Pearl Harbor was dead. The Japanese continued to resist American forces advancing in the Pacific, but thereafter, those efforts were almost always defensive. In a sense, the shooting down of Admiral Yamamoto can be considered another turning point in World War II. And I've read since I wrote this paper that there's another reason that maybe Yamamoto should have survived. One was to not reveal the Japanese code had been broken, but also because some believe that Yamamoto had influence with Emperor Hirohito that some of the other military leaders didn't. And Yamamoto wasn't as gung-ho for continuing the war at all costs and he might have been persuasive with Hirohito, might have actually convinced Hirohito to bring the war to an end earlier than it ended. I take that back, it is in my paper, the next paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Others criticized the mission as having been foolhardy because it might have revealed to the Japanese that their codes had been broken. <laughs> 
How else could the Americans have known that, Jap that Yamamoto was to be flying over Bougainville on April 18, 1943? If the Japanese had changed their codes, American operations in the Pacific might not have been successful. The Japanese did not come to the conclusion that their codes had been broken and did not change them, possibly because immediately after the mission, American P-38s launched more raids from Guadalcanal to Bougainville. Their primary pur purpose was to deceive the Japanese into believing that shooting down Yamamoto was just a lucky coincidence. I'm going to show some slides that illustrate some of the points I'm going to be making, but I wanted to mention something about the sources that I got my information from. Some of them were primary sources available at the Air Force Historical Research Agency. And when I was on that committee to re-examine the mission, we were supposed to, our marching orders were to just look at the documents, the primary source documents that were available at the time and not to consider other evidence, such as the wreckage that people found later. Some of the most important primary sources of information regarding the mission to shoot down the Yamamoto aircraft are stored at the Air Force Historical Research Agency. Among them are histories of organizations such as the 347th Fighter Group and the 339th Fighter Squadron for the period in question. An example is Kem Dow's, D-O-U-G-H, Kem Dow's history of the 339th Fighter Squadron for the period 30th October 1942 to 31 December 1943. Another good primary source is the story of the 339th Fighter Squadron, produced by the 13th Air Force Public Relations Office for the period March to April 1943. There is also a 13th Fighter Command Detachment Combat Report for 18th April 1943, also called a Deep Briefing Report at the agency. The agency also maintains an 8 March 18, 1989 oral history interview of Cargo Hall my former boss at the agency, with Major G General John P. Condon, U.S. Marine Corps, one of the planners of the mission. Letters from or to the Yamamoto mission par participants relating to the question of whether Lanfear or Barber should receive sole credit for the shoot-down were some sources for this paper. Among them were a letter from Thomas Lanfear to John Mitchell dated 18 July 1984, a letter from Rex Barber to Thomas Lanfear dated 12 September 1984, and a letter from Thomas Lanfear to Rex Barber dated 18 September 1984. The relations between those pilots deteriorated and continued to deteriorate after the mission. There were other letters that were, are available at the uh, Air Force Historical Research Agency relating to this mission. There are some good books that were written about the, the uh, the Yamamoto mission, too, and I wanted to mention some of those. I was talking to somebody earlier who mentioned he had read Burke Davis's book called Get Yamamoto. It was published in 1969. It's a good book, but it was written before the discovery of some of the wreckage. It mentions not only what Lanfear did, but also what Barber and other pilots did in the attack. R. Cargo Hall, who once headed the research division, and in whose office the 1984 Victory Credit Board met, wrote a book called Lightning Over Bougainville to defend the conclusion of the board that both Lanfear and Barber shot down the Yamamoto airplane. Two later books on the subject argue, argue that Barber should have gotten full credit because they discount the Lanfear account of the mission. They think Lanfear wasn't completely honest. And because of the discovered wreckage of Yamamoto's airplane that show it was hit more from the back than from the side. One of these books is Attack on Yamamoto by Carol B. Glines, and another is Lightning Strike by Donald A. Davis, which was published in 2005, the most recent book I'm aware of about the Yamamoto mission. Other good secondary sources on the book are books on the breaking of the Japanese code, and to save a little time, I have some of these other sources if you're interested in learning more about these sources, but I do want to mention some of the Japanese sources. One is Hiroyuki Agawa's The Reluctant Admiral about Admiral Yamamoto, and Matomi Ugaki, Fading Victory, the diary of Admiral Matomi Ugaki, who was on that second bomber that went down over, sea. He, over the sea. He survived the attack, even though he was badly injured. 
Before I open the floor for questions, I'd like to show you some slides that illustrate some of the points I wanted to make about the Yamamoto mission. I work at the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base, and that's the leading repository of documents relating to Air Force history, especially related to unit histories. We have squadron histories, group histories, wing histories, the histories of numbered Air Forces, and so on. If you want to find out information about an Air Force organization or about missions, this is one of the best places you can go. The one thing we don't have, we don't have a lot of personnel information because that's concentrated in St. Louis at the National Personnel Records Center. This is a photograph of Admiral Yamamoto. I didn't mention this in the paper, but he was familiar with the United States. He had been in the United States <clears throat> more than once on official business. He had even been there for higher education. He was familiar with the United States and the culture of the United States. And he is supposed to have said that if we go to war with the United States, we'll have to dictate surrender terms in, at the White House. And it was misinterpreted that he wanted to do that. What he was saying was, if we get involved in such a war, the Americans will not give up unless there is a, a total uh, defeat. Admiral Yamamoto was very well respected uh, by his own people and by the military leaders of Japan, and he was very uh, much respected by, by the Emperor Hirohito. Yamamoto had planned the Pearl Harbor attack, even though he wasn't actually on the mission. He was back in Japan, but he had planned the Pearl Harbor attack, and that's one reason why he was so hated, because people assigned the guilt for the Pearl Harbor attack on him, not just the Japanese, not just Emperor Hirohito, but on the actual planner of the attack, Admiral Yamamoto. And the attack was very successful. One of the problems was that it didn't destroy the aircraft carriers. The American aircraft carriers were not at Pearl Harbor. If they had been at Pearl Harbor, we would have been in even worse, worse shape than we were. And there were no follow-up attacks to destroy the fuel supplies at Pearl Harbor. If that had happened, if the aircraft carriers had been destroyed and if the fuel reserves at Pearl Harbor and on Oahu had been destroyed, then the uh, war would have gone, uh, would have been much more difficult to prosecute, at least in the early stages. Yamamoto was also involved in planning for the Midway attack, which might have succeeded if the Americans hadn't broken the Japanese codes and knew exactly where the Japanese were. Even then, it was a pretty close fight. There were a lot of Japanese, a lot of American planes attacking the Japanese carriers without much success at first. Uh, you might have seen the movie Midway that showed some of that. It was a, a close call at first, but as a result of the Battle of Midway, the Japanese lost four carriers and they were no longer on the offensive after that battle. This is, yes. Right. And kept the secret that the code had been broken right. for, all, for 10 months by then. That's amazing. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kept all that uh, classified. So the Japanese didn't know their codes had been broken. If they had known their codes had been broken, they would have changed the codes. Well, they did do some minor change of the codes anyway. That was just routine. But the Americans generally knew what the Japanese were going to do before they did it. And a lot of times people will ask me about, well, this, was, this Yamamoto attack was exactly a year after the Doolittle Raid. Were the Americans planning to get him just as an anniversary uh, of the Doolittle Raid event? And that wasn't the case because Yamamoto was planning to get close to the American lines on that particular day. So it just happened to be exactly a year. This is the map of the Solomon Islands in the Southwest Pacific, and it shows Guadalcanal near the bottom on the right, right there, and Bougainville 
is up there. And Yamamoto was coming from a ball up here. So Yamamoto was coming one direction, going south eastward, and the American planes generally were flying, were flying northwestward from Guadalcanal, but not on a direct path. This was in the southwest Pacific. This is the island of Bougainville. Some people said it, it looked kind of like a violin, shaped like a violin. But it was the southwestern end of Bougainville where Yamamoto's flight went, down in this section. This is the kind of plane that carried Admiral Yamamoto. And I'll give you some more details about the size of the plane and, and uh, the dimensions of the plane and its capabilities in relation to the other planes that were involved in the attack in just a few minutes. But you could see it was a fairly large plane. It had very long range. It had high capacity. It could hold six persons, generally, on board. Yamamoto and his part of his staff were on there. Four of, of the staff, him and three others, were on this plane with the pilot. And the other Betty Bomber had four other members of his staff with the pilot, with the crew. You could see it was a twin-engine plane, but it was very vulnerable to enemy aircraft fire because it didn't have a lot of armor. It sacrificed armor for range. This is a Japanese Zero A6M fighter, very uh, efficient plane, very light, and it could outfly the fighters of the Americans at the beginning of the war. But as the war went on, the Americans had superior planes to the Japanese Zero fighter. But this is the kind of plane that was escorting Yamamoto's bomber and the other bomber. There were six of these Zeros. And it's suspected, we don't know exactly, that there were some other Zero fighters from Kahili, an airfield on the southern end of Bougainville, that might have also joined in the fight. Because both Lanfear and Barber were claiming to have shot down some Japanese Zero planes. All six of the Zero planes on the Yamamoto mission returned. Their pilots survived. So they weren't shot down. So it might have been some other Zero fighters that emerged from Kahili that were shot down by the American pilots on this mission. This is a comparison of some of the Japanese planes that were on the Yamamoto mission. On the left, you see the Mitsubishi A6M Zeke, or the Zero. And on the right, you see the Mitsubishi G4M Betty bomber. And you, can see, you can't see all the, the details there. I have a chart that I'm going to show you in just a few minutes that show you uh, the comparison of these planes and the American planes. You could see the Zero was very light and fast and maneuverable. The Betty bomber was not. Its advantages were its capacity to hold crew and bombs and also its range. These are the planes that the Americans were flying, P-38, twin-engine fighters. I was talking to somebody just before this lecture about the P-38s. P-38s were known in the Pacific Theater more than they were known in the European Theater, but they were in both theaters. The Americans flew P-38s in Europe, in the Mediterranean, as well as in the Pacific. But in the Pacific, they got more reputation because the leading American ace in World War II of any war was uh, Dick Bong, and he flew a P-38. And the, the second ranking ace of the Americans was Thomas McGuire with 38 aerial victories, and he also flew a P-38. So that's one reason why the P-38s have a reputation in the Pacific. They both were flying in the Pacific theater. This is a comparison of some of the planes. The planes that were on the, the Yamamoto mission, there were three kinds of planes. The Betty bombers, the Zeros that were escorting them, and the P-38s that were attempting to shoot down the bombers. And you can see, if you look at the range, the plane that has the advantage is the bomber. The Betty bomber had more range. In speed, you can see the plane that had the highest speed was the P-38. Not necessarily maneuverability, but speed. In World War II, P-51 pilots were able to sometimes to shoot down German jets. They could fly 100 miles per hour faster than them because of maneuverability. And so the, sometimes the zeros weren't really that out 
spranked by the uh, P-38s that could fly faster than them. In ceiling, you could see how high the planes could fly. The P-38s could fly higher, but on this mission, they were flying low. Remember, they wanted to conceal their presence, so they were flying very low over the water, and they had to climb to get to the altitude of the bombers. The bombers, on the other hand, were descending from a higher altitude. Usually, if a fighter is shooting down or trying to shoot down a bomber, it's coming from above, but that wasn't the case with the Yamamoto mission. You can see the crew. Uh, yes? Right, without the wing tanks. So we had much lower, we lower That's right. Uh, this is assuming they're flying at their cruising speed. And the P-38s on that mission were flying at about half their cruising speed so that they could serve fuel. They also had larger fuel tanks, as you said. That's a good point. You remember that one way to Bougainville was 400 miles. So to get back, if they had gone the same route, it would have been 800 miles. But they went back more directly, so it was more like 700 miles. But that's a good point. Thank you. Sir. Yes. That, that's the, I guess that's the, uh, the range to a target. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And you could see with the crew, the reason the Japanese chose the Betty to transport Yamamoto and his, his staff was because it could hold more people than some of the other planes the Japanese had. It could hold seven. The length of the planes, you could see the uh, Betty bomber was much larger and more vulnerable, partly for that reason. The wingspan, you could see armament. The, the Betty bomber had a lot of guns, but it was so slow and so vulnerable because it didn't have much armor. And you could see the comparison between the Zero fighters and the P-38. The P-38 had five guns in the nose, and I didn't bring it but uh, I have a 50 caliber uh, bullet that shows how big the bullets were that the P-38s were firing, much larger than the Zero bullets. And one of the curious things about the wreckage site for the Yamamoto plane, the Betty Bomber, that they found, they found that Yamamoto had two wounds from the rear, but one of the authors of one of these books said that he wasn't hit by 50 caliber shells. If he had been hit by 50 caliber shells, the wounds on Yamamoto's body would be much larger. So he was probably uh, hit by pieces of bullets or by shrapnel as the plane was going down. But uh, there was definite proof that they found Yamamoto's body because of the things that were on his body, his uh, personal papers, some of the personal things he had with him, and because of those fingers he lost in the Russo-Japanese War. Yamamoto, by the way, was very, very short. How yeah. old was Yamamoto? I wish I could tell you. I'm not sure how old he was at the time, but he was in the Russo-Japanese War at the beginning of the 20th century, and uh, I guess if he was 20 around then, he would be around, yeah, in his 60s if he was in his 20s at the time of the Russo-Japanese War. These are some playing cards that were used in World War II to help the soldiers, help the airmen recognize their planes and enemy planes. They had to recognize their own planes, they had to recognize enemy planes, and to help refresh their memories about what they learned at briefings, they had these on cards. And I got a deck of one of these World War II credit, uh, decks of cards from the World War II Museum a while back. And you could see the Japanese Betty Bomber Mitsubishi Type 1 Betty, the Japanese Mitsubishi Zeke, which was the Zero, and the US fighter P-38 Lightning. Yes? Well, that's a good 
question two, that was the first question that came to us when we were looking at the records. Why don't we look at the gun camera film? There was no gun camera film. And one of the reasons there was no gun camera film, they had to fly such a long mission. They didn't want to put these heavy cameras on the planes, which would reduce their range. They wanted to make them as light as possible. So they didn't put gun camera films on the planes that went on these missions. If they had, maybe we'd have fewer questions about who actually got down, got Yamamoto. But that's a good question. You could see the, the shape of the planes, too. It was fairly easy to tell some planes apart from other planes just because of the way they were made. These are passengers on the two Betty Bombers, Admiral Yamamoto and three other passengers and two pilots on the first plane. And the second plane, four others of General Yamamoto's staff and two pilots. Three on the second bomber that went out down over the sea. All the, the people who were on the first bomber died. But on the second bomber that went down over the sea, three of them survived. Can you imagine if Yamamoto had been on the second bomber, on the one over the sea, he might have survived like Ogaki did. And that's one of the arguments that the Army Air Force people were making in the planning right before the mission. Uh, the Navy personnel wanted to get him on a boat and uh, they were afraid that if he got on the boat, he might survive. Or if he, maybe if, even if the boat had been hit, he might have gotten a life preserver or something and, and survived. These are some of the personnel involved in the planning for the mission. The Marine Corps officers involved. Major Alva Brian Red Laswell, I mentioned in the paper, and some other Marine Corps personnel. And I mentioned these in the paper, too. So the Marine Corps should get much of the credit for the success of the Yamamoto mission. It wasn't just an Army Air Force's mission. Like the Doolittle Raid, exactly a year before that, that was a, also a joint mission. Remember, the Doolittle Raid was American B-25 bombers, but they were launching from the Hornet, which was a, an aircraft carrier of the Navy. And Mitcher, Admiral Mitcher, was the admiral who was in charge of the, the Hornet at the time of the Doolittle Raid, and he was also in charge of the uh, air people on Guadalcanal. Yes? Uh, this was 59th birthday. So maybe he was still a teenager at the time of the Russo-Japanese War. OK. Thank you. This is my wife, Ellen Hallman. In the <laughs> Thank you. Right, right. These are some of the Navy officers involved in the mission. Admiral Nimitz. And there were some who thought that maybe Nimitz made the decision on his own to get Yamamoto. But he didn't make it on his own. He, he checked it out with Washington first and made sure it was OK with Roosevelt for them to go after Yamamoto, because it was somewhat controversial on whether you should assassinate an enemy leader. And uh, Roosevelt and Nimitz decided that, well, this is war. He's in his uniform. He's on a mission. We're on a mission that he would be fair game. Admiral Mark Mitcher, who I mentioned, was commander of the Joint Air Operations in the Solomon Islands and also involved in the Doolittle Raid exactly a year before that. And Commander Stanhope C. Ring, Fighter Command Solomon Islands was also a Navy guy. So it wasn't just the Marine Corps, it wasn't just the Army Air Forces, it was also the Navy. And here are the Air Force personnel involved. Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Tyra, who I didn't mention in the paper, was involved because he was the commander of the 18th Fighter Group. John W. Mitchell, if I had to give anyone more credit than anybody else for the mission, I would say uh, Mitchell because he spent all night before the mission, making sure that all the statistics were right, the air speeds, the directions, considering all the different factors. And Captain Thomas G. Lanfear, Jr. was the leader of the attack flight, and his wingman was Rex T. Barber. There were other Air Force personnel involved, Holmes and Hine, Hine being the one who didn't return. I don't think so. 
uh, I didn't research that, but there were so many Mitchells in World War II, I doubt if he was related to him. This is a route of the Yamamoto mission from a book by Carol Glines called Attack on Yamamoto. Glines is one of those who thinks that Barber should get full credit for the Yamamoto shootdown. But you could see the route. There are a lot of books that have the route in them, but they went west from Henderson Field, one of the fields on Guadalcanal, and then northwest, and then northwest on a different angle, and then northeast. And they, when they got to the rendezvous area, at first they were a little concerned because they didn't see the Japanese planes at first. But just a couple minutes later, there they were. Yamamoto was on time. They had gotten there actually a little bit early. This is a picture of some of the pilots on the mission. On the left, you see Thomas Lanfear, who claimed right away that he had gotten Yamamoto. When he landed and made that claim, uh, Rex Barber on the right landed, and he heard Yama, uh, Lanfear making that claim, and he asked, he said, how do you know you got him? There were two bombers. How did you know which one he was on? And Barber knew he had shot at both bombers. And uh, Lanfear got mad, said he was a liar. So the, the relations between those two pilots deteriorated almost immediately. And the guy in the middle is Besby Holmes, who got half a credit for the second bomber. The guy that's missing is Hein on the attack flight, and it's because he didn't return that he's not in the photograph. And I wonder sometimes if Hein had survived, if he had come back and reported what he had experienced, maybe he would have gotten part of the credit for shooting down that second bomber. Because in hindsight, right. <laughs> Good one. Yes. Well, they they had they had significant careers after that. Uh, Landfair, as, as I mentioned, was the first president of the Air Force Association. He even considered running for president as the man who had shot down Yamamoto. And uh, the book that has more information about what they did after the war is the last book that was written uh, about it. Uh, let me see, I have a reference to it. Lightning Strike by Donald Davis. He has more information about Barber and Lanfear afterwards than anybody, and he mentions when they died and everything. But they had this ongoing controversy for years and years, and uh, as I mentioned, it didn't stop when the Air Force split the credit. It didn't stop when the committee I was on decided to keep the credit split. And it didn't stop when the, aerial, when the Victory Credit Board met in Washington. And they couldn't agree. Some of them thought it should remain split. Some of them thought that uh, Landfear shouldn't get any credit. Yes? So it didn't stop when they died. No, no, it didn't stop when they died either. And I don't know if any of you have heard of the American Fighter Aces Association. The American Fighter Aces Association met around the time of this controversy uh, when the court was deciding, and they decided to give full credit to, to Barber. But they're not an official organ. They're just an uh, unofficial civilian organization composed of former veterans, of veterans. But uh, they claim that Barber should get full credit. and. Some of you might agree. Yes? Dan, I have two questions. What was the purpose of Yamamoto in the Navy? That's a good question. Yeah, I didn't mention that. How did he do all this? OK, well, OK. The, the first question about, that's a good question. I should have mentioned that. Yamamoto was on an inspection trip. They were involved in a major operation in the Solomon Islands involving Guadalcanal. And he was trying to inspire his troops. He was visiting frontline areas. And he was going near the front to encourage his troops. It was mainly a morale, to stimulate morale during this, this operation that they were involved in against Guadalcanal. So that was the main reason he was going. There were some that didn't want him to go. Some of the Japanese thought it was too risky for him to do so, but he thought, he would be fine, especially if he had six escorts. 
Uh, the, the question about how I voted, I voted, it, it was a unanimous decision, all of us who looked at those records. But I have to say, you know, what you decide depends upon the evidence you look at. And we were told by the chairman of the panel, just look at what the primary sources were from the time. Don't consider anything else. And when we did that, we had to come to the conclusion that Lanfear and Barber both claimed to have shot down a bomber over the island. There was only one bomber that went down over the island. We had to come to the conclusion that they, they should split the credit. But if you consider the other evidence, and I'm kind of leaning more that direction now, looking at the wreckage and looking at where the, the bullets or the part of fragments of bullets came from, it looks like Yamamoto's plane went down more as a result of fire from the rear than from the side, and that supports Barber's argument. It's hard to, uh, hard to support the Landfear account because the wreckage didn't show that the plane had been hit from the right side like, like Landfear claimed. Yes? That's a good question, too. Uh, I, some of the books I read about this, and uh, they claim that he was dead when the plane crashed, that he had been killed almost immediately. But if he had been killed almost immediately, it would have been from those smaller wounds. And the smaller wounds might have come from the shrapnel of the crash. If it was fragments of 50 caliber bullets, that had broken on the way uh, to him, then you could say he, he might have been killed in the air before he crashed. But I think that hadn't been determined exactly yet. Some think he was killed immediately, and some say he was killed as a result of the crash. When they found his body, they said it was better preserved than some of the other bodies. But he didn't show any signs of having lived very long. If he did live, at the time of the crash, it wasn't very long after that. Yes? What happened to the, the escort pilots? What happened to the All, all six escort pilots uh, survived and went back to Rabaul. And one of them lived longer than the others and wrote his account. And when he came out with his account that all six of the zero pilots, whom he knew personally, had returned safely, he was involved in one of these, they called it the Yamamoto retrospective, one of these meetings after the war of some of the people who were involved and some of the people who knew about it. And when he reported that all six Zero pilots returned safely, survived that day, then there were those who claimed that uh, the Zero, the credits for shooting down Zero planes should be taken away from Landfear and Barber and Holmes, who claimed to have shot down zeros as well as bombers that day. And at first, that was a decision. Cargo Hall said, take away those credits. But the decision was changed later because there was always the possibility that some of those zeros might have emerged from Kahili, an airfield near Bougainville, that uh, might have taken part in the later action, you know, trying to get those P-38s. Yes? Just how long did the degree That's a very good question. I hadn't, I don't have the answer for you right now. I, th I think it was probably within 10 minutes that all this happened. Now, when you're involved in, in battle, I think sometimes things seem a lot longer than they are. But uh, just go, going by Barber's account, and Barber's account, you know, he, he survived longer than Landfear. He lived longer, and he, he wrote about his experiences. But he says that after he shot the first bomber that went down over the island, almost immediately he went after the second bomber, and uh, Holmes was already shooting at the second bomber. Holmes couldn't figure out why the second bomber wasn't going down, because he was firing so many bullets into it. And then Barber also fired bullets into that bomber, and it blew up. 
and pieces of that bomber were still in his plane when he landed at Guadalcanal. <laughs> so he got partial credit for shooting down that plane. But I think that was just within a few minutes. All of them that survived the mission, the three pilots that you see right there, were recommended for medals of honor, but the Navy said no. And the reason was because Lanfear had told everybody he had gotten Yamamoto. The Navy was so upset about revealing that information about the breaking of the Japanese code that it was reduced from medals of honor to Navy crosses. They got Navy crosses, but they didn't get medals of honor. Right. They still get, got Navy crosses. Yeah, sometimes that happens. <laughs> Between services. Mm -hmm. Yes. How many of the U.S. escort flights got back? All of them got back. The only, the only P-38 pilot that didn't get back was Hein, and he was on the attack flight. And he wasn't originally scheduled to be on the attack flight. You know, he was one of those, like Holmes and Hein moved over to the attack flight because of the other two escort, the other two uh, attack flight people that couldn't make it. There was another question too. Yes. I don't think so. I know that uh, originally there was a group in support of Barber that sent a team over there and at first, they couldn't go to the crash site because there was some internal trouble. There was some civil strife on the island of Bougainville, and it wasn't safe for them to go to the site. But when they finally, when uh, representatives did finally get to the site, that's when they discovered that the plane was hit more from the back than from the side. And that's one of the reasons, see, we didn't have that information. When I was meeting on the panel to decide this case, we didn't have that information about the wreckage because they hadn't gotten to the wreckage site yet. Yes? You had mentioned that this took approximately 10 minutes, and just a lot of bullets flying from both sides. Right. Could that not have been one of the only three bullets that came in and killed it, It's interesting. Smaller it's interesting you mentioned that because my wife and I were both talking about the same possibility. What if the, the zero pilots that were trying to shoot the P-38s who were trying to shoot the bombers, what if some of the zero pilots accidentally shot the bombers? Because you can imagine if a zero is chasing a P-38, which is chasing a bomber, then maybe some of the zero's bullets went past the P-38s and hit the bombers, especially when you consider the wounds that... Uh, that Yamamoto's body had. They were more like the zero bullets. Would have been more like the zero bullets. Yes? You uh, used the situation with the bomber being killed with the last trip. Right. I think I heard somewhere that the Navy actually had better chances of getting the plane if they were. That's true. That's true. In fact, he, he asked for that. He asked for a better compass because he was going to be leading the mission. And all the other P-38 pilots on this mission, remember I said there were 18 P-38s on the mission at first, and they were all going to be keying on him and turning when he did. And so he did have a special Navy compass that was originally designed for a ship on his P-38 so that he could tell exactly what the angle was, what the directions were. That's right. It's a good thing. Yes. Right, it was time, airspeed, and the compass. And they were all keying on the flight leader, Mitchell. If Mitchell had made the wrong turn, or didn't time it right, then they wouldn't have rendezvoused at the right time and place. And that's one of the reasons why I think Mitchell should get more credit than anybody else. Because not only did he plan the mission about the airspeeds and about the, the angles and about timing and about the, uh, the compass, but uh, it worked. All of, all of his planning. And 
I don't want to take away credit from the Navy planners who originally were designing the mission, but Mitchell ironed out all the details. He took what, the, what Condon had developed and he made it a lot more detailed. And even corrected some of the miscalculations. Yes? Yes, I think they did. That's a, that's a good question. I think most of the bullets they were firing were 50 caliber. But I don't know if they were using any incendiary bullets or not. Uh, there was a cannon on the P-38 too. I don't know if you're familiar with the P-38, the way it's made. I'll go back to a, an image of it. But you could see in the front, see those guns in the front? Most of those guns were 50 caliber machine guns, but there was also a cannon. Yes, and I don't know if the 20 millimeter, I don't think it was uh, incendiary. I, I know that when the bullets hit the bombers, they became incendiary because the bombers had so much fuel on them, and it, it set fire to the bombers. But uh, I kind of doubt if the shells they were firing were incendiary. Yes. That's right. Well, he wasn't shooting himself. Yeah, he was one of the escort. He was leading the escort fighters who were hovering overhead because they were expecting these zero fighters to emerge from Kahili Airfield. And when you look back, you know, hindsight is hindsight is 2020. But uh, I think if I were planning the mission, the change I would have made, I would have had more planes in the attack flight especially when it turned out there were two Betty bombers instead of one. Uh, but those 16, those uh, 14 bombers, no, I'm sorry, uh, of the P-38s, there were 16 on the mission. So four of them were on the attack flight. That meant 12 of them were in the escorts. Uh, the escorts were so high, they, were, they had climbed to 15,000 feet, they didn't see what was going on. And one of the questions I had was, wouldn't one of those other P-38 pilots have seen what was going on below them? But they were so high, they didn't. Uh, it's believed that Mitchell was called back by Lanfear to, to help him against some of these zero fighters. Yes? When did the American pilots break free of the pilots? When they saw the planes, when they saw the enemy planes. There was uh, one of the P-38 pilots Canby, I think, was his name. And when he saw the planes, uh, he said something like tally-ho or something like that to show that the, they, were, they had found them. And then radio silence wasn't necessary after that because the Japanese already knew they were there. Yes? Uh-huh. That's right. That was one of the factors he had to consider uh, in the night before the mission. Mitchell spent many hours working on all the details, and it, it turned out that most of his calculations were correct. So it was, it was amazing what he did. Of course, he wasn't only relying on his own figures. He was relying on some of the preliminary figures that the Navy guy, Condon, had come up with. And, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, Major John P. Condon had developed the initial flight plan, but Mitchell took that initial flight plan and put in all the details. And he also wanted that compass, that Navy compass, so he would have a more accurate uh, directions. So this is the map that shows the, uh, the circuitous course that they took to get there. It doesn't show the course they took to get back. They went almost directly back because they had so little fuel left. Yes? Yes, each plane was on its own. In fact, uh, Holmes didn't even land on Guadalcanal. 
because his plane had some damage and he was having trouble getting all the way back to Guadalcanal, so he landed in the Russell Islands, which was uh, just to the to the northwest of, of Henderson, of Guadalcanal. And he eventually made it back. And when he made it back, he was angry because Lanfear and Barber had already told their stories. And it contradicted a little bit his story. He wanted credit for the second bomber. And he did eventually get half credit for that. Um, one question. You said that somebody commented that possibly the people who were in the, you know, the pilots who were in the T-38 submarine could have seen what was happening below. Uh -huh. Uh, well, they couldn't see very well because Bougainville was a jungle island. And the planes, the, the Betty bombers, were camouflaged. So it would have been hard to see, even if they had been closer. They were 15,000 feet, and these operations were much, much lower. Yes? Yeah, they had radios. They could pretty much hear. In fact, uh, Landfear, when he was flying, he was calling Mitchell, and he said, I think I got a bomber. Make sure you saw that. So he was contacting Mitchell, and then he asked Mitchell to come help him because zeros were on his tail. Incidentally, when Landfear got back, there were two bullets in his plane. When Barber got back, I think there were maybe over 50 <laughs> holes in his plane, plus evidence of wreckage from a bomber that had exploded. So Barber had a lot more souvenirs showing what he had done than Landfair did. Yes? OK, usually when, when there is a flight, uh, no matter how many fighters are on a mission, they're in pairs. And the wingman is supposed to protect the lead pilot. And the wingman kind of keeps observing the lead pilot in case somebody gets on his tail. And the wingman supports the lead pilot, especially on a mission like this. Landfair was in charge of the attack flight. The attack flight had four planes in it. But his wingman was, was uh, Barber, and Barber was supposed to make sure he went with him. Something I didn't describe too much was when they first saw the bombers, and they saw there were two Betty bombers, and they saw there were six Zero fighters. Both of them, Landfear and his wingman, couldn't just go after the bombers because they were afraid those six Zero fighters would shoot them down. So Landfear went after the fighters, and Barber went after the bombers at first. And then Landfear claimed that after he shot down one of the Zero fighters, he flipped over and saw the, the bomber and shot at it. And so that's, that's some of the uh, confusion. But the wingman generally supported the other pilot, made sure there was nobody on his tail. And the, the wingman and the lead pilot would also support each other. But they usually flew in pairs. Yes? Right, these were Army Air Force pilots flying Air Force planes. Well, yeah, it was it was first lieutenant. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, I should have added that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I was abbreviating. Uh, but yeah, they were first lieutenant. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, and the Navy. Navy ranks and the Air Force ranks are different, too. We had somebody in our Sunday school class once who was a Navy captain, which is a lot different from an Air Force captain. And he was living on base. And of course, he was in some of the higher ranking officer housing. And he had Captain uh, Sanders, was it? And uh, people would criticize him. They'd say, how did you get a house? You're a captain. How did you get a house with, the, with these colonels? And he, he put up a USN sign to, to eliminate the doubt, because a, a Navy captain is much higher than an Air Force captain. Yes? Was the competition fierce throughout the Pacific as the fighter pilots? It was, yeah. And to, just to give you an example, 
Dick Bong was the leading American ace. He shot down 40 planes in World War II, more than any other American pilot of any war. And Thomas uh, McGuire, thank you. Thomas McGuire had 38, and he was just behind. He was trying to build up his score so he could pass Bong, and he got reckless. They believe on his last mission, he did some things that were a little bit more reckless than he should have done, all because he was trying to get those other two credits so he could catch up with Bong and maybe exceed Bong. So there was a lot of competition among the pilots. Right. That's right. It, it does. It does. I think the reason was because of Kahili Airfield. Kahili Airfield was near Bougainville, near the southern end of Bougainville, and they, were, they knew it was a Japanese fighter base. And so they wanted to make sure that those fighters didn't interfere with the uh, attack flight. Uh, and by hindsight, it looks like maybe some of those P-38s should have been, should have been lower, and there would have been more observers, too, to what actually happened. Now, Ogaki, you know, one of the Japanese, one of the three Japanese who survived the mission, when he came back, you know, they asked him what he saw, and he said he saw Admiral Yamamoto's bomber, and he saw it turn rapidly when it was being attacked, and he saw it being chased by P-38s. He said P-38s, but apparently it was only one P-38, and uh, it uh, crashed on the island but he didn't see who did it. He just said it was being chased. And he said, I think they, it might have been a mistranslation, he said by P-38s, but it might have been by a P-38. Th this is a book that describes the mission that has a lot of the sources in it, and it's gonna be available uh, in just a little while for anybody who'd like a copy, they're, they're just $5 each. I don't sell them for the same price that they, it's marked. It's marked 750 or 725. The reason is because I'm the author and I get a discount, and I just sell them for the same <laughs> price that I get them for. But before we do that, before uh, I sign copies of books you might want to get, let me ask you if there are other questions. Yes. P-38. He flew P-38s, yes. McGuire too. I believe he was roping him back to the U.S. and died as a test pilot. That's right. Bong, not long after the war, uh, came back and was a test pilot in California, I believe, and died on one of those test flights. So he didn't live very long. M McGuire, of course, got killed trying to catch up with Bong. Yes. Right, it was called the Fork Tail Devil. That was one of the nicknames of the P-38. That's right. And I did, uh, some of you might have been here when I talked about the, the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, some of the fighter escorts on the 15th Air Force were flying P-38s. So uh, they were flying the same kind of planes. P-38s were a very good plane. They weren't as fast or maneuverable as the P-51s. But uh, the P-38s, I guess because of their range, they were used more in the Pacific because of the ranges they had to fly. Uh, just like the B-29 bomber, some of you are familiar with the B-29 bomber used on the atomic missions. They weren't designed for atomic missions, but they were designed for bombing Japan from very long ranges. And they were not used in Europe because they weren't needed in Europe. The, in Europe, the B-17s and B-24s were doing the job and they didn't need the, the extra long range. Let me see if there's another slide. Oh, here are some other books about the Yamamoto mission, some of which I, I mentioned. The Attack on Yamamoto book gives credit to Barber. The Lightning Strike gives credit to Barber. Get Yamamoto splits the credit. The Reluctant Admiral splits the credit, and Lightning Over Bougainville splits the credit. So some books say Barber should get full credit, and others say the credit should be split. But we don't have the definitive answer. 
I guess God knows who, who really did it. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Well, he claimed, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. He claimed after he shot the bomber, he was being attacked by zero fighters, and he was crouching behind that armor plate behind a seat. That's right. And that probably saved his life. It probably didn't save Hein's life. You know, we don't know exactly what happened to Hein, but he's the only P-38 pilot who didn't make it back. All the six Zero fighters made it back. All the other P-38 pilots made it back. The two bombers went down in one P-38, and possibly some Zero fighters from Kahili that were the fighter pilots claimed to have shot down. This is... A, a, No, it was Holmes. When, when Holmes, right, Holmes got back. When Holmes couldn't release his reserve tanks, he wanted to drop the auxiliary tanks so he'd have more speed and maneuverability and so he'd be less vulnerable too. And he had to do some very quick maneuvers, a lot of acceleration to try to get rid of those tanks. He finally did, but when he went off in a different direction, Hein was his wingman, so he went with him because he was to protect him. So that left only two fighters, Lanfer and Barber, to face these eight aircraft for a while at the very beginning of the encounter. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked, I've read, I've got a biography of Yamamoto, and I don't think I have it listed. No, I don't have it listed here, but it's written by a Japanese. It's called The Reluctant Admiral, and it has that information. Oh, it is on there? Okay, The Reluctant Admiral, that has the answer. I think he did go to a, a naval academy, uh, but he also went to... Uh, American institutions of higher learning. <laughs> Went to Harvard, right. Spoke English? Yes, he spoke English. Is he more on credit for saying that he did in the war or was he in the Yes, and that was, I don't know if you saw the movie Tora, Tora, Tora. That's one of my favorite war movies because it shows both sides of the Pearl Harbor attack. And it's more nonfiction. It's not a soap opera type plot. But it shows exactly, well, it shows what happened, but they couldn't use the real planes. They had to use some other planes to make it look like the planes they used. But at the end of that movie, they, they have that quotation of Yamamoto. Yeah, Yamamoto uh, is sometimes admired by Americans because he had been an American himself. He wasn't eager for, the United, for J Japan to go to war with the United States, but he figured if, if Japan was going to go to war with the United States, then they should do a knockout blow at the very beginning, try to disable the only means by which the Americans could reach the Japanese empire by destroying the navy. And he almost succeeded. Twice. <laughs> yes. There were, one of them was in his jaw. One of them entered his, his left jaw and, entered, and exited his temple and one of them was in his left shoulder blade. And there were small wounds. So we don't know exactly what caused them. Some say it might have been fragments of bullets from a 50 caliber bullets, and some of them say it might have been from the shrapnel. It could have been self-inflicted. Oh, no, I don't think they were self-inflicted, no. <laughs> yes. It was the Japanese. Yeah, the Japanese, not long after Yamamoto disappeared, and they didn't know exactly what happened to him. Of course, Ugaki, when, his, when he was recovered, Ugaki reported that Yamamoto's plane had been, gone, had been shot down. So they, they launched a recovery team into the jungle. And part of the jungle, the Japanese, even though they controlled the island, they didn't control all parts of the island. So it was still jungle. 
But when they got to the site, they, uh, they were able to determine that was Yamamoto's plane and that was his body. Yes, yes, they found his, his body. The plane kind of disintegrated when it hit. They believe that the right wing hit a tree that severed the right wing from the rest of the plane. And then they found wreckage all over the place. And yeah, his seat and his body were separate from the fuselage. That's right. OK, uh, we're getting close to the end. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to get some of those books, if you would. And I'd be glad to sign them. Thank you very much for letting me speak with you today. <laughs>